Um, so we found that our system was equally good at distinguishing better from worse language outcomes in monolingual patients and bilingual patients. And uh, our bilingual patients were worse than expected based on trends learned from monolingual patients alone. When I first saw the unusual result, I was, I was concerned by it. I didn't think, oh, um, here's an unusual result. We'll get that into brain. Quite the opposite. I thought, we won't get that into brain because nobody's going to believe it. At the moment, we're in the Wellcome Trust Centre for Neuroimaging. It's in Queen Square. Um, I've heard it called Brain Square by various others. We were trying to extend previous work that we've done to predict language outcomes and recovery after stroke. We've done that earlier work, like almost all neuroscience has done in this area, on uh, monolingual English-speaking patients. And quite a lot of doctors had quite rightly asked us whether and how well this is going to apply to real stroke patients, and in particular to people who speak more than one language. Bilingualism is an extraordinary feat of the human brain. So there's a lot of um, studies in the literature that have suggested that bilinguals have an advantage with language and their cognitive processing, that bilingualism is good for you, and therefore that led to a prediction that you might actually expect some bilinguals um, to be able to recover better than people that only speak one language. We collect demographic data, behavioural data, so we test their language skills, a lot of different tests, tests of reading, tests of writing, speaking and understanding, and we collect structural MRI. Like there were times we were literally like living down here and you know you're having lunch down here or you just spend very long hours down here. A lot of, of gossip has been exchanged down here. Uh, I personally am very lucky in that we have a large dedicated team of people here who actually do the testing of patients and push them through the pipeline of scanning and metal checking. I don't know how to do that stuff at all myself, so uh, as I say, I'm very lucky. Um, my name is Louise Slim. I'm a speech and language therapist. I'm also a research associate on the PLORAS project. It's, it's really interesting getting to see patients who are at such a range of stages post-stroke. Sometimes it can be quite difficult when patients are really, really impaired um, and you want to be able to help them and kind of cue them through the test, but because it's research we need to be very objective and kind of keep that distance. Um, so when I first saw the result I did not believe it. Um, I didn't think that the first author could possibly have made a mistake, um, but I thought there must be some other factor that needed to be considered. Once we found the result, then it became a game of working out what covariates might explain the result. In a nutshell, there are really two effects. The first is prognostic models built from monolingual data alone for language outcomes after stroke do apply, can apply equally well to bilingual stroke patients. But the second effect was, uh, this was much more surprising actually, um, was that there was effectively a bilingual disadvantage for language outcomes post-stroke. This was so surprising that we actually delayed the publication for months on end whilst we considered every possible explanation that we could come up with as to why the bilinguals might be doing um, worse. The remarkable thing was that every time you know we accounted for another variable the results just became more and more convincing to show that the, the bilinguals were um, at a disadvantage. We really threw the kitchen sink at it and it survived um, and I, I was surprised. I was surprised for the first eight months and then after a further eight months I was no longer surprised. And finally, why do you think I should read this paper? Um, <laughs> I think you should read this paper A because it's incredibly well written um, uh, and because it represents a lot of blood and sweat from me but no, you should read this paper if you're either interested in language and particularly in the difference or lack of difference between the monolingual and bilingual brain. And you should also read this paper if you're interested in and certainly skeptical of the prospect of predicting these language outcomes in practice. I think it has convinced me still further that the kind of thing that we're doing really can work in practice and that after all is the point of doing it.